This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, hi everyone, and back to CST24N. So this week is going to be the remainder of the content on machine translation, and today I'm going to talk more about the kind of alignment models that people have used to learn about how to translate words from how words translate from one language to another language. And then I'm going to embed inside of that a discussion of the EM algorithm that we use for a lot of NLP tasks, including this alignment algorithm. And then on Wednesday, so the stuff today is really the core stuff that's the second programming assignment. And then on Wednesday, I do more of a survey of more modern and recent work in machine translation. Okay, so you, you'll hopefully remember from last time that the general picture is that we've made this sentence aligned data where by and large the sentences are aligned so that they're translations of each other. And we're essentially then wanting to run this algorithm which is looking at words that could translate each other and settle down and learn possible translations for a word as in this baby corpus. And so formally, starting off for what we did for IBM Model 1, that the overall picture we have is we have a lot of French and English parallel sentences. So we have a complete conditional probability of our corpus of the probability of all of our French stuff times the probability of all of our English stuff. And I tried to add this into, the, into this slide that wasn't there um, last time, and I made a boo-boo in my copy and paste already, um, since this should be a product, not a sum. Sorry, that should be a product. Um, so, it should, so we take that probability, um, and it's just simply the product of the probability of each French sentence given each English sentence. Product, right there on the top line. Okay, so then for an individual French and English sentence, what's its probability? Well, there's first of all a probability of how long the translation is going to be. So the probability of the length of the um, French sentence, capital J, given the length of the English sentence, capital I. But then the core of it is that what we're doing is considering over here how different, how different French words align to English words. And we do that in a slightly funny way. Once we've decided the length of the French sentence, we can just take these positions and say, okay, there's a probability distribution over this position being aligned to any English word, including the possibility of it being aligned to no English word, the null. And so we have a probability of AJ equals I. And then given that we make a certain alignment, we then have the probability of having generated AJ given that the English is been. So these probabilities, FJ given EI. And in particular, in model one, the alignment probabilities are just taken to be uniform. So there's kind of no real content in them at all. And so what we really have is these probabilities of FJ given EI. Okay, so what we want to do um, to learn these alignment models is run the EM algorithm to maximize the likelihood of big F given big E. That's ultimately what we want to do. But given that some of the assumptions this model makes about chances of different alignments being uniform, etc., if you actually boil it down, um, what you end up having to do is what's in this slide. And as I said last time, essentially this slide can just be a recipe for what you have to implement for the first half of the second assignment um, for re-implementing model one. So what you do is that you just start off with FJ given EI just being uniform. You just give every English word uniform chance of being translated by the different French words that you find in your training corpus. Um, and that includes, in particular, that you can have the special English word null generate various French words, the French words that appear in French that aren't really translations of any English word, various kinds of function words. 
So what you do, then do is you iterate through your data and you consider each position in turn in the French sentence and you calculate a posterior over alignments. So you want to work out what's the probability that this pos French position is aligned with a particular English word. And the way that you do that is that you use your current estimates of what's the probability of FJ given EI. Because remember, there's no independent information about which alignments are likely. That's assumed to just be a uniform probability distribution that we're not changing. And then you just normalize it based on all the different possibilities for English words that you could have. So this gives you a probability of a particular alignment for position J. So you work these out for all positions J, and then based on doing that, you then inc you increment these counts. On, and these counts are kind of fractional counts of according to your current model, how much of an evidence do you have for there being alignments between particular French words and particular English words. So if you work out here, that there's a 0.3 chance that J equals 5 aligns to I equals 2. You then look at what the French and English words there are, and you increment the count for that pair based on that probability that you add 0.3 to it. So you're adding these fractional counts um, of different alignments. OK, so you do this over the entire corpus. And so this is the E step of the EM algorithm. And then at the end, you have all of these fractional counts from going through the corpus. And what you do is you just renormalize them to turn these into probabilities. So you, can sit, you have fractional counts for every FJ given EI. You total up how many of those there are for a particular EI. And then you divide through by that total again. And so these become the probability of FJ given EI. Um, and so then you have new estimates for this quantity, and you go back up to the top, and you go through and um, do it again. Um, and you keep repeating this for a while, and lo and behold, you get a translation model. OK, um, so the first crucial question for understanding this is, why does this work at all? Um, here's, the, here's the argument why it shouldn't work at all. OK, we've got this simple model. And I've told you that there's no information about the length of the French sentence that translates the English sentence. We just assume a uniform distribution up to some convenient large upper bound, like 10,000 words. Um, there's no information, when we went back a slide, there's no information about the probability of AJ equals I. We just assume that that's uniform, and we never change those estimates. And when we start off, we start off by assuming that the probability of FJ equals EI is uniform. And so it sort of looks like every one of these is the same. And when you're considering different EI prime down here, this quantity is the same for every possible EI. So it sort of seems like you've got the same thing dividing over some of the same things. And it kind of looks like it'll just come out the same for everything. So you'll do this renormalization, and all your estimates will still be the same, um, and it won't go anywhere. Um, that's not actually true. Um, so let me pause for a moment. I mean, why, why does this algorithm learn anything? So effectively, yeah, we, we, get, we are going to get something out of this. Um, I guess I want something a little bit more precise. Why does that manage to give us something out of it? Yeah? 
Yeah, so at each iteration, right, yeah, I guess I kind of just say it here. I don't actually have an equation. At each iteration, once I've made these counts, count of fj given ei, I then, re I then renormalize them. So I sum these counts for all j to get a total of the count mass of things involved ei, and I divide through it. So I've got a new estimate um, the next time around for fj given ei. So yes, I'm changing this at each iteration through. But the question is, you know, given that it starts off uniform, and I'm having uniform divided by sum of uniform, um, why do the estimates change? Why do I actually learn something? Any good ideas on that? People think this will learn anything? Or totally hopeless? Yeah? Well, so what is the evidence that I'm using? What's that? I mean, I guess a way of focusing this question is, I mean, what is the crucial source of constraint that this algorithm is exploiting that means it actually learns something? That's kind of close to it, yeah. Um, I'll call that near enough, and I'll say the answer. So, so that's kind of it, yeah. Um, so if if here you were summing, if here you were considering all French words and all English words in your vocabulary, and you were doing this recalculation, I mean, you, you would just learn nothing because it would be uniform over sum of uniform, which would be the same every time, and you get the same thing out every time, and you'd learn absolutely nothing. The reason that this algorithm learns something is it exploits one crucial source of information, which is that you've got these, you've got started off with these aligned sentences. So you have some information if, for all the sentences that have the word bongo in it, that 80% of them have some particular word in their translation, then you learn something. So the crucial reason this algorithm run, learns something is kind of hidden effectively over what we're, what we're summing over here, where we're not summing over every possible word in the vocabulary. We're summing out of the, over the candidate words in the English sentence. And so it's precisely because We've actually got real sentences, and we're considering you know, the, the alternatives in a real sentence, and only those words. But that gives us a source of constraint. In particular, um, if we run it on a one-word sentence, where there's a French word and an English word, um, what we're going to learn from this, if we ignore nulls for a minute, they're also the chance of nulls. But if we ignored nulls, so null wasn't a possibility, if we had a one-word sentence, we would learn that the probability of this is whatever it is, A. There's only one thing position to sum over, so it will be the same quantity A. So the probability of the alignment would come out 1. So therefore, we'd get one count mass, which would be given for saying that that English word is translated by that French word. Okay, um, so we're kind of learning from what we saw in the data. And you can extend up from that and say, well, what is it, what about if I get a two-word sentence? Well, the first time around, again, if you ignore the possibility of nulls generating words, well, this, 
is just whatever it is. Um, and then there are two possibilities down here. And again, both of them have the same estimate because we start off uniform. And so you're going to get a half. For each French word, you're going to get half of a chance that it aligns with each English word. And so these counts here are going to be a half. And so effectively, the first iteration through you run this, all you're doing is counting sentence co-occurrence counts scaled by the number of words in the sentence, i.e., if it's a 12-word sentence and the words co uh, once each in the sentence, you're counting a twelfth. Um, so you're just counting fractional counts like that for the number of times that things co-occur. And that already gives you a lot of information because, you know, that's like back to the example of the Centauri Arcturan. If you just see things co-occurring a lot in sentences that translate each other, that's pretty good information that they have something to do with each other. Okay. Um, Okay, um, so I'll go on then later to some of the later models of the IBM models, but let me just sort of, at around this point, I'll step back and say one remark, or maybe I'll say a few remarks, because I meant to mention a couple of remarks, and then go off and do the EM part. Um, so in terms of typologies of learning, um, how many people know about supervised versus unsupervised learning? Almost everyone. What is this? Unsupervised. Um, now, in general, in machine learning, does unsupervised learning work well? Um, I mean, people use it sometimes, but I mean, I think it's true to say that throughout most of machine learning, unsupervised learning doesn't work that well. I mean, that's being a bit harsh, but I mean, so we have the contrast between clustering, the classic contrast is between clustering algorithms which are unsupervised, you throw in a bit of data and you cluster it somehow and see what you get out, versus classification algorithms where what you do is you hand label data, so for something like email spam, you say this one's spam, that one's not spam, this one's spam, that one's not spam, and you learn a spam classifier using kind of standard classification algorithms. And so, I think it is fair to say that in most of machine learning, that although doing unsupervised learning is kind of fun and sexy and interesting, that for a very large space of problems, it kind of, you kind of sort of get a clustering that looks kind of tantalizing, like it's capturing some structure, but the results just aren't that good and you don't know what to do with it. Um, and so, by and large, most of modern machine learning has been driven by supervised training supervised classification methods where precisely somebody sits around and hand labels pieces of data and you go and learn a classifier off of it. So it's actually it's sort of in yeah. Um so I mean well I'll say that in just a moment. Um right so it's kind of interesting that um what you're doing here for learning these alignment models um, is unsupervised learning. Um, and it's actually one of the best cases of large-scale unsupervised learning that actually works really well. So all the state-of-the-art big machine translation systems that are statistical machine translation systems, um, there's a lot of other stuff going on, but at heart for the alignment, algorithms, everyone uses souped-up versions of this where you're doing unsupervised um, alignment algorithms, and they just work extremely well once you have tons of data. Um, but there has also been some work doing supervised alignment algorithms with small hand done alignments of small numbers of sentences, but effectively you can get the unsupervised data at such scale and the unsupervised algorithms work quite well enough that it's what everyone uses for big MT systems. Okay, and then the question was, well, wait a minute, this isn't quite unsupervised because, well, you started off with um, translations of sentences, and that's kind of like supervised data um, because someone provided those translations and that gave you information. And, I mean, the short answer is, yeah, that's totally right. I guess what I should have narrowed my claim that the 
The part that's purely unsupervised is learning this alignment model. So the learning of the alignment model is completely unsupervised, but yeah, there's sort of supervision for the overall problem of how to translate of particular sorts. And that's maybe a moment when I can say just a general comment that I think turns up a lot in natural language processing, that in machine learning there's this classic distinction between unsupervised algorithms versus supervised algorithms. And it's a sensible thing to think of, but a lot of the time in natural language processing that the binarity of that distinction isn't very useful. Because a lot of the time in NLP, the kinds of things that we'd like to do is work out how we can get a lot of value from a small amount of supervision. And so a lot of things people do in all sorts of domains, they're not purely unsupervised algorithms, but on the other hand, to do all of the learning supervised would require an enormous investment of resources that may not be likely or practical. And so a lot of the time, people would like to do things where you have a little bit of supervision. And so the, the idea there is, well, you know, suppose I could easily get my hands on a dictionary. There are lots of dictionaries around. Suppose I let myself use a dictionary, but I had no other information about how words are translated in context, and I'll learn all the rest um, based on the context. That seems a useful thing to try and do because we know we can exploit dictionaries that are pre-existing. So a lot of the time, people are wanting to exploit pre-existing resources and easily obtainable stuff and then build the rest of it out unsupervised. Okay. Okay. So at this point, I'll deviate off and say a bit about um, the EM algorithm. Um, but before I do, just sort of to mention a couple of the announcements. Um, a couple of the SCPD students said, gee, it would be much nicer if the quizzes were due on Sunday rather than Friday. And so we're going to have the quizzes due on Sunday. Um, don't forget that assignment number one um, is due on Wednesday. And now there's always one or two people that blow all their late days on assignment one. But you're really much better off um, saving them for later. Um, so um, do get working on assignment one, and then we'll be handing out assignment two um, just to keep everyone busy. Um, and the final um, thing I thought I'd just mention is sort of for um, contacting me and the TAs for questions. Um, we have both a mailing list and we've got a news group. I mean, if you've just got garden variety questions which aren't something about your personal problems but are just not understanding how the assignment works, we really encourage you to use the news group if you can because that kind of makes it easy for us to give answers where other people can go looking for answers in case they have um, similar problems. Or if you get really lucky, maybe one of your fellow students will tell you the answer to the problem before we even get back to it. Well, that's lucky for you and for us, actually. Um, so um, do think about using the news group. Okay. Uh, I could do midnight if you want. Sure. I'm <laughs> sure we can have them do it at midnight if you want. <laughs> okay. Um, the EM algorithm, right? So this is this expectation maximization algorithm, which is often used for unsupervised learning. Um, so I know it's always the case in CS224N that there's kind of a spectrum between people who've never seen the EM algorithm before and people who've already seen it in three different classes. Um, I hope never let, I mean, certainly I know for myself the EM algorithm confused me about the first five times I saw it. So therefore, I hope that nobody has seen it enough times that they can't learn something um, from my presentation here. Um, but I mean, in particular, I hope to kind of work through a little practical example. Because I mean, I think a lot of the time, certainly for the kind of discrete data that we work with mainly in NLP, that, you know, the EM algorithm in theory is kind of confusing, but in practice when you're actually sort of working through a concrete case of what you have to do, it's actually kind of straightforward what you work out and how you work with it. Let's hope so. 
Why is my screen going off? Um, okay. So the gen so the so what I'm going to do here is just for discrete data um, and for an easy case in these slides of estimating the parameters of an n-gram mixture model. So the general idea is EM is a method of doing maximum likelihood estimation. So what we want to do is we have some data and we have some parameters which are meant to be a model of that data and somehow we want to fiddle around with those parameters just like usual um, to make the observed data as likely as possible. And you know in theory anything you've ever learned about an optimization in optimization you could attempt to use for that problem. But in practice the EM algorithm is used a lot in, as an iterative algorithm in places where you can't find the kind of gradients that you need to use other optimization methods. So in particular, the classic kind of place where you see the EM algorithm is when you're doing things like mixture modeling. So here we have um, some data, the XI data, which is a mixture of some probability distributions. So this is exactly what we saw in the language modeling part of the class where we said, well, we can do linear interpolation of several models. We could estimate things with a trigram model or a bigram model or a unigram model, and we're going to combine those estimates together with some weights theta. So in particular, for the problem I'm looking at here, we're now saying the trigram, bigram, and unigram model are completely fixed their parameters aren't being changed. All we're wanting to do is assign these theta weights that combine them together. So we really only have two parameters in this little baby example for a trigram as to how to weight these models. Okay, so for when we have the entire data set, we've got the entire data set X, and we want to say, okay, what's the likelihood of the data given our parameters? Well, what it's going to be is the product over predicting each word, which is then going to be worked out as a sum over our different component models weighted by the likelihood that's given to each component model by our theta parameters. So you have this picture where, where you, what you want to calculate is a product over a sum. And it's when you see that configuration that's the classic place where you always end up using the EM algorithm. Okay. So, so the EM algorithm is used when you have incomplete data. And so when the EM algorithm was originally developed, the idea of incomplete data was you were somehow missing a couple of data points. Um, so that the idea was you were doing some experiment in the lab and some klutz knocked over a couple of test tubes and you were missing those two test tubes and you'd, that you'd like to do analysis of your experiment anyway. And so what you wanted to do is reconstruct, the, reconstruct what would have been in the two test tubes that you didn't actually get to measure the content of. Okay. Um, and so that's the case of really incomplete data. Um, that's never the case that we're dealing with in the kind of models that we're making. What we're assuming is that there's certain data that we can observe, which is here the Xs, but we're assuming because we have some kind of generative story that underlying that data, there's other data that we can't observe, which is here being called the Y. So the Y is referred to as the completions of the data. And so we are pretending kind of our data is artificially incomplete, that there's some underlying extra stuff going on in it that you can't actually see, but that we're going to be trying to reason with. Okay, so what we're doing here is that our complete data is saying, well, for the n-gram model, there are the actual words that we can observe. But secondly, we're assuming that there are these Y choices. And the Y choices, according to our generative story, was, was this data point generated by the trigram model, the bigram model, or the unigram model? So that our generative model is corresponding to our mixture model is. So when you want to generate the next word, you first of all roll your dice to see whether to 
generate from the trigram, bigram, or unigram component models. And then having chosen one, you roll the dice again, and then you choose a particular word to have generated. And so it's the choice of which model to generate from is our y, and y variables. And so the y variables effectively have three values, one, two, three, as to whether you're generating from the unigram, bigram, or trigram model. Yeah. I think it's kind of what our model will be filling in the blank with. I mean, in particular, when we actually do this, I mean, for this, the standard case, what the y, what we're going to actually be interested in with the y is the probability distribution over its value, so values. So we're using the model to say, well, the thing that we couldn't see, it's 80% likely it had this value, 15% likely it had this value, and 5% likely it had the remaining value. Okay, yeah, so our y's here are just 1, 2, 3 for unigram, bigram, or trigram, so that the likelihood of the complete data where the y's, if we assume that the y's were observed, is just that we're generating the probability of the word according to a different component model. Okay, so um, if we look at, you know, if we imagine completed data and we, that we knew where the y's were, the sum over components is gone since the y, a yi variable tells you which component it's coming from. Okay. So an important thing to get straight in general is that there end up being two, two data likelihoods around here. There's the actual observed data likelihood, the probability of x given theta, and then when, if we assume completions, i.e. we give values to the y, we then have a complete data likelihood, which is the probability of x comma y given theta. And the idea of the EM algorithm is that we want to maximize the observed data likelihood, but we're going to use completions to make that easier to do. Okay. Um, so why is that? Um, that's because we're assuming it's hard to work. If we have products of sums, it's hard to work out the complete data likelihood. On the other hand, it's easy to work out the Sorry, it's hard to work out the observed data likelihood. On the other hand, it's easy to work out the complete data likelihood if we know the whys. So the general idea of the EM algorithm is you alternate these two steps, that you assume some completions for your data and then work out what good, good values for the theta parameters would be. And then you use those theta parameters to try and work out what the completions are most likely to be. And you repeat over and again those two alternating phases, um, which is what is expressed essentially in that slide. But I'll go on fairly quickly um, to the more concrete part of it. So the E step is we work out expectations which tell us how likely different completions are. And then the M step we, work, we maximize the log likelihood of the complete data, which isn't the same as maximizing the log likelihood of the observed data, but it's the least close to it. And that we hope by doing that in an iterative algorithm, we'll get um, better results. An important thing to notice here is when you're running the EM algorithm, the completed data isn't a constant. It's something that varies with each iteration as you come up with better estimates. Okay. So here's my um, final trying to do it a bit more formally. Okay, so we have the likelihood. For a certain set of parameters, we have the likelihood of the data, which is the probability of all of the data given the parameters, which will then be, since we haven't observed the y's, the sum over the y of the probability of x comma y. Okay, and in particular, since we assume that each word is generated independently, we have a product over the x's of the sum over of the y's of the probability of x, y given theta. And so that's precisely where you have this product of sums 
which is hard to optimize. And the reason it's hard to optimize is in general, products of sums give you a non-convex surface. So you get all of these local maxima. And so even running the EM algorithm, you have problems with these local maxima. OK, and so what we're going to want to do is sort of the answer to the question. Since we don't know what the y's are, we, we're not actually going to want to hard assign the y values. What we're actually going to want to have is a distribution over how likely the different values for y are. And we're going to effectively treat them like little mini partial data items, where we're going to have, say we have 0.7 of a data item where y is the trigram model, 0.15 of a data item where y is the bigram model, and 0.15 of a data item where y is the trigram model. OK, um, now around this point um, is when in conventional presentations of the EM algorithm, people um, drag out Jensen's inequality. People heard of Jensen's inequality? So, yeah, remember Jensen's inequality? Anyone remember Jensen's inequality? No? Who's seen Jensen's inequality? Some people? Well, anyway, I was going to try and do it, do it without doing Jensen's inequality in an easier way. Um, and so this is an easier way. Um, this, this way of doing it uses a very simple fact. OK, what is the arithmetic mean of the numbers 1 and 9? Easy question. 5. OK, what is the geometric mean of the numbers 1 and 9? 3. OK. Um, and so just like in that example, the geometric mean is always less than the arithmetic mean of numbers. And so if you stay out of log space, you can represent what you can do with Jensen's inequality just with arithmetic means and geometric means. So if you, remember, if you just remember that um, the square root of 1 times 9, 3 is less than um, 1 plus 9 divided by 2, 5, that's the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality which is the same idea that you use for doing the EM algorithm. OK. And so here it is in its general form. So you can put arbitrary weights on the different components. And where these weights add up to 1, um, and that your geometric mean is less than your arithmetic mean. OK. And we're going to use this um, to do the EM algorithm, because what we have is a product of sums. And if we can turn that inside sum into a product, we then have something smaller, a lower bound, which would be a product of a product. And so that would lower bound what we're interested in and would give us a basis. Because if we can kind of push up that lower bound, um, then we'd have made progress and we'll be able to have an attempt at optimizing things. OK, and so well, we have this um, probability of a completion, the probability of x, y given theta. So that can be our um, z, i here. But somehow, we want to get in a notion of what can our w, i be to run this algorithm. And so how can we do that? And the way we do that is by introducing an iterative algorithm where we go through a succession of updates of updating our weights. Um, so that means we start off with some guess for our parameters. It doesn't have to be a very good guess. It has to be some guess for our parameters, which is called theta prime. And so according to our uh, original guess for the parameters, that gave the data some likelihood value. It doesn't matter what it is. It gave the data some likelihood value. OK, now what we're going to want to do is come up with an improved set of estimates theta that is better than our old theta prime. OK, well, our old estimate was just whatever it was. You know, it, it, was, some, it was some estimate of the parameters at, that gave some likelihood to the data. So this previous likelihood we can regard as a constant um, because it was just whatever it was. And what we want to do is come up with a new theta that makes the observed data more likely. And so, get a sec. Um, and so what we can do is instead of directly trying to optimize um, theta, we can instead try and make this relative 
change in likelihood as much as big as possible. So the likelihood according to the old thetas is some constant. And so if we can make the likelihood given our new thetas such that that ratio is big, we've improved our estimates of theta. Yes. Well, your training data, strictly speaking for this case of, if you're, for the case of doing the mixture model for a language model, your training data for learning the mixing weights is the validation data, right? So the validation data serves as the training data for the purpose of learning the mixing weights. Okay, so it's sufficient um, if we can make this likelihood ratio large. Well, how can we do that? Well, um, here's a little math derivation that's so, so slowly foot, um, spelled out that even I can understand it. Um, so we just write that down. So here's um, the likelihood of the data given our, our new model theta. And there's the likelihood of the data given our old parameters theta prime. We can pull the product out the front. We can pull the sum out the front where this sum is just concerned with the numerator, not the denominator. In this step here, um, we multiply by one. So the terms on the right-hand side is just this constant, well, this number over a number, so that's multiplying by one. And then in the final step, um, we take this term over to the left and we multiply those two denominator terms to get the product of x comma y given theta prime. That's not too hard math. Um, that hopefully makes sense. Okay, but if we look at this, what we've now got on the inside is that we've got a sum of relative likelihoods that are weighted by the probability of y given x comma theta prime. So this is something in the shape of the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality. Because here we have a sum over some quantities with some weights. So we can apply the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality right there. And so that's what we do on the next slide. So this is just what we had at the end of the last slide. And if you quickly look. Look, remember back to the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality, we take the weights by which we're combining things and turn them into exponents, and then we have a product. And so we can say that this quantity is greater than this quantity. Okay, um, so now we have a lower bound which is expressed just in terms of products. So that's kind of pretty. Um, but in terms of maximizing this lower bound, we kind of don't need the denominator here, because that denominator is just a constant. Um, so for the purpose of maximizing the lower bound, we can throw it away and instead just maximize something that's proportional to the lower bound. And so that gives this Q equation, which gets called the auxiliary equation in the EM algorithm, where we've got the likelihood according to the new theta estimates raised to the power of the likelihood given the old theta estimates. Yeah. Why it so sorry, why is are we, why is what we're guess in our mixture model what we're guessing generated the, the individual data points. So the values of y are just one, two, or three as to did, the, did our unigram model generate this data point? Did our bigram model generate this data point? Did our trigram model generate this data point? I bet it'll make more sense when I get to the concrete example in just a minute. This is just to confuse you before I do the concrete example um, to show you all how easy it is. Okay. Um, okay, so this is sort of a summary um, of that. And the crucial thing is this here is something we can easily um, 
maximize because products of products, they're nice, easy things to maximize. We can use our calculus on that and we can work out how to maximize them. In particular, as I've already pointed out earlier, for these discrete probability distributions, actually the way you can maximize them is just using relative frequency. You don't even have to remember calculus. Um, but if you remember some calculus, you can prove that the way to maximize them is just using relative frequencies. Okay, um, that's that. Um, okay, um, I can sort of say that. Okay, um, so, if it, so we run this algorithm and each step you know, we guess the completions, we then change the parameters to make the guess completions as likely as possible. We then re-guess the completions, change the parameters again, and do that. And so, provably from doing that, and I've sort of almost proved, is that each iteration, your, your theta guesses must make the observed data more likely. Um, what I've presented here isn't then a complete proof that the EM algorithm works, because the other half of it is actually showing that my lower bound gets tight as I approach a solution, which I haven't actually tried to do here, but I'll leave that part out. And um, let me move instead for a bit um, to my spreadsheet. Okay. So I think all of this makes a ton more sense and is really quite easy if you see it being done in a spreadsheet. Um, is that big enough that people can read, or should I make it one bigger? Dodgy. Okay, let's see if I make this 200%, would that still fit? Yeah, that'll be cool. Okay, is this readable? Hopefully. If it's not, you just have to come further forward until you can read it, since I think I need about that much width of screen. Um, okay, so what I'm wanting to do is estimate the trigram. Prob I'm wanting to estimate a probability distribution over words that come after comes across. Okay, and so in my original training corpus, I saw comes across ten times, and eight times after comes across was the word as comes across as an idiot, kind of a common idiom. Once there was comes across the, and th once there was comes across three, and that was what I saw in my training corpus. I saw ten instances of comes across. Okay, so based on my training corpus, I've trained by maximum likelihood estimates, let's say, a trigram model, so that's easy. This is point 0.8, this is point 0.1, this is point 0.1, and every other word is estimated as zero. And then I've also estimated a bigram model and a unigram model. And well, I haven't shown you the rest of my training corpus, but let's just assume this is my bigram model and my unigram model. Okay, now what I want to learn is a mixing, mixing weights between these three models to make the likelihood of some held out data as likely as possible. Okay? So in my held out corpus, I've seen, um, I get to see comes across five times. So I see comes across as three times. I see comes across the zero times, comes across three zero times. And I see comes across a once and comes across one once. Okay, so that's, this is now my held out corpus. And so what I'm going to do in the EM algorithm is I'm going to, I called them lambda here, but here are my, here are my theta, or lambda, my wix, mixing weights between a unigram, bigram, and trigram model. And so I'm going to want to set these weights so as to make the likelihood of the held out corpus as good as possible. And I'm going to do that with the EM algorithm. So to start off, I have to start off with some initial guesses for what these tri what these mixing parameters are. And I guess, you know, 0.7 for the trigram. I mean, it really doesn't, it's not going to really matter what I pick, um, as I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so here's how concretely I run the EM algorithm. So what I want to do 
is say, okay, here's my, the things I observed in my observed corpus is um, as, uh, and like. Let me work out how likely each model is to have generated them. So, or how likely it is to have generated them in different ways. So, if I see the word as, well, what's the chance, what's the kind of chance of it being generated by the trigram model? The chance of as being generated by the trigram model is there's a 0.7 chance of the trigram model being selected, and then there's a 0.8 chance of it generating the word as. So if I run my mixture model, the chance of it generating the word as by having used the trigram model is just the product of those two quantities. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Given, yeah. I mean, I, all through this, I'm assuming that the context is this comes across before it. Um, I've got my mixture model. It's going to generate the next word. What's the probability that it'll generate as having when using the tri using the trigram model to do it, it's 0.56. Okay, well, what's it can also generate the word as using the bigram model. And what's its chance of doing that? Well, its chance of 0.2 of selecting the bigram model. Then, given it selected the bigram model, there's a this is a bit of a high estimate, but in the model as it's sitting here, there's a 20% chance of it generating the word as after a cross. So this is effectively the probability of as given a cross. Okay, so again, we just multiply those together and we get 0 0.04. And so I fill in all of this table. That, that makes sense? Okay, so, well, if I then want to ask for my mixture model, what's the total chance of it generating the word as after comes across, well then I'm summing this column. That because the mixture model is the sum over the probability of generating it with the component models. So these are the overall estimates that my model gives to the different, generating these different words after comes across. So my initial data likelihood is then to take, since I saw as three times, and the other words once is to take this probability and cube it, multiply it by this probability, and multiply it by that probability, which is what I do with this equation. Right? So I take um, this probability cube times that probability times that probability. And so I get my small number as my data likelihood. Okay, so then at this point, I run the EM algorithm. So for the EM algorithm, what I want is a probability distribution over completions, which is over the choice of whether a unigram, bigram, or trigram model generated different things. And this is actually easy, right? So there's a total 0.6 chance of generating as next. And of that 0 0.6, 0 0.56 out of 0 0.6 chance that came from the trigram model. So I literally take this by that, and that's the probability distribution that the trigram model generated it. Okay? And similarly, I just do, do the same divide through and say there's a 6% chance the bigram model generated it, teeny chance the unigram model generated it. So I get here um, my um, chances of different models generating things. In particular, since the trigram model gave zero probability estimate to generating a uh, after comes across, the probability of the trigram model being the thing that generated it is also zero. Okay, so these, this is my probability distribution over my com completions. And so from there, I work out my expectations. And so the expectations is then just a count of how often I expect how often I expect to have seen different completions. So since I saw as three times in my held out corpus, my expectations for this column are simply three times um, my probability as distribution here. So I'm taking 
that number and multiply it by 3. And so this column I'm multiplying by 3 there, and since these words I saw one time each, their expectations are simply the probability estimates. Okay, um, so this gives me expectations of how many times I was in the trigram, I used the trigram model to generate as after comes across. If I then want to just work out um, my total expectation for my held out corpus as to how often I was in the trigram model, what I then do is sum across the row. But since these are zeros, the expected number of times I was in the tri using the trigram model to generate something was 2.7 times. But then for the bigram model and the unigram model, I sum these rows and I say, okay, my, my best guesses were I used the trigram model 2.7 times, the bigram model 1.4 times, and the unigram model 0.7 times. And so if I sum those expectations, um, they add up to five, the number of items in my validation corpus. If, 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 you sum, you, you, if you sum these and they don't add up to the size of your data set, you'd know you've done something wrong um, during the course of it. Okay, so up until there, that, that's my E step. I've worked out expectations over the completions. And so now I do the M step, which is to change the parameters, oops, to change the parameters to make my data more likely. And so the way I do that is I just re-estimate the mixing weights based on my current guesses of how much I use different models. So it looks like I was in the tri used the trigram 2.7 out of 5 times, I slightly more than 50% of the time. So I do that division and I get a new estimate for the mixing weight of the trigram model, which has shrank. Remember I started at 0.7, but it's shrunk to 0.55. And then these two weights have grown. And intuitively that makes sense, right? Because for my held out corpus, since the trigram model can only generate three of the observed five words because it's given probably it's giving a zero estimate to the other two words. It just can't be the best thing that gives highest likelihood to the data to give a mixing weight of 0.7 to the trigram model because at most it can have generated three fifths of the data. So it sort of seems like its weight must be less than or equal to 0.6. Yeah. You, um, so you're kind of getting to a point where I'm making this example sort of easy. Um, but so if you're doing this for real, you're certainly, yes, summing over every history to work out good mixing weights. And then there's a question of how are the mixing weights done? And I sort of mentioned in class that there are a couple of possibilities for that. Um, you, one possibility was if you're just doing um, the simplest form of linear interpolation, your mixing weights are just, you just have one for each order model. And so then you, you sum this over all possible contexts, and then in the same way, you just re-estimate, and you get weights on the trigram, bigram, and unigram model. There are more subtle ways to do it in which you kind of put different estimates based on things like the count of the context, so you have more parameters in your mixture. Um, and you can explore that if you want for the homework. That just makes things a little bit more complicated, but it's in principle the same. What you don't want to do is actually have different mixing weights for each possible history. Because if you have mix, different mixing weights, in real life, if you have different mixing weights for each possible history, it's hopeless, because then your mixing weights are being estimated with just as or even more sparse data than your original distributions. And so the mixing weights you learn are completely overtrained. Because if in your held out data you saw only things that you saw on the trigram model before, you'll put all the weight on the trigram model and zero on the other models. And then you're not achieving what you'd like to achieve of 
having this do smoothing for you between the models. Okay. Um, so at that point, I've, I've re changed my estimates for my mixing weights, and then I can go back to the start, and I can work out, okay, for my, for my new model with these weights, um, which I've just again put down here, um, I can work out the likelihood of the observed data, i.e. the held out data, according to my new model. So it's exactly the same as before. I work out the chance of a trigram model, the trigram component generating as, which is simply the, ch the weight here times the probability in the trigram model, and then I sum these, and now the probability of as is 0 0.5, which is lower than before. The probability of R is this and this. And if I work out my data likelihood in the same way as before, the crucial thing to notice, which I've now just caused to go off the screen, is behold, my data likelihood has gone much bigger than it was before, right? It used to be um, 4.9 times 10 to the minus 5, and now it's 6.4 times 10 to the minus 5. So my data likelihood has gone up by 30%, right? So fiddling these lambda weights um, is doing something useful for me. So, yeah. Right, this is the actual data likelihood. No, you have to see an increase. But because the completion lower bounds the actual data likelihood, it necessarily... Huh. I think that's right. Yeah, no, you really have to see it. You, well, strictly it could stay the same. It, it, that it has to stay the same or increase. You have, you have to, you can't possibly have a reversal in the actual data likelihood. Um, yeah, but this is just working out the actual data likelihood of my held out data. I'm just working it out by su taking a product of, of the sum, which is the sum is going down these columns. Okay, so at that point, um, I just repeat. So I work out probabilities over completions again. Um, I then work out expectations to be in different states again. Um, I then um, take the probability, I work out probabilities for my mixing weights by again just dividing through these expectations via the total, and again, I get these different weights, where again, the probability estimate of using the trigram model shrinks a little bit. Not, it's, staying, it's not nearly as much as the first time. But I do it again, and lo and behold, my data likelihood has increased a little. It's now increased from 6.4 times 10 to the minus 5 to 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 5. And I keep on doing this, and now it's 6644. And 6666 and 6680. I was able to do this by cut and paste. I didn't have to um, type this all in. And I keep on going 6689, 6694, 6698, 667. One of the things that you should learn from this about the EM algorithm is convergence of the EM algorithm is pretty slow. You have to kind of run it for a while and go through iterations. But nevertheless, um, the likelihood of the data keeps on going up, and you know I keep on chugging by. And essentially, what it's converging to is that the weight on the trigram model is a half, the weight on the bigram model is 0.4, and the weight on the unigram model is a tenth. Okay, um, so let me just ask kind of a couple of questions on this. So when you know, I chose these mixing weights at the beginning. Um, what would happen if I'd sort of started with the bigram weight as 0 and the unigram weight as 0 0.3? Um, what would I expect to be the end result after I'd run this to convergence? Yeah? Mm. No, that is not the right answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is the right answer. So 
So your answer is right most of the time, but it's not right if something is zero. Um, so if, if something is zero, it's got no chance of generating particular data points. And so when I work out what's the probability of having used the bigram model to have generated different things, it's still zero because it had no chance of generating them. So the expectations are zero, and it stays zero. And well, as you can see, I had these strings hard-coded rather than them dynamically um, generating, the <laughs> generating the truth. Um, so this one's growing, but that one ain't changing at all. And if we run it to convergence, um, the weight is just being split between the trigram and the bigram model. Um, what, what, your answer is right most of the time. So I really didn't have to start with these numbers. If I start off with 0 0.1 and 0 0.5, well, 6, let's say, 0 0.6 and 0 0.3, it actually makes no difference. And if you go down to the bottom, you're getting the same kind of a half, four tenths, a tenth distribution. I mean, so a lot of the time, what you find with the EM algorithm is that if you choose extremely extreme values of this parameter, this parameters that you can get to bad local maxima and you'll get different answers in the time. But fairly often, there'll be a fairly broad range of middle values of starting parameters and they'll converge to the same local maxima. Yeah. Um, that certainly should be the case. So if we go to the end, wait, wait I've got to go, so, well, no, this one does. So if, if I choose any kind of middling values, my data likelihood ends up as about 6.705 times 10 to the minus fifth. If I go to the case where this was zero and, well, here's another trick. Um, it doesn't actually matter on the first iteration of what you give it as a probability distribution, because when it re-estimates things, it'll turn it into a probability distribution. So um, if I start off with the middle one zero, I guess my data likelihood never gets nearly as good. Yeah, because the bigram model is useful. Um, I think that would... I mean, I can try it. I think that will be bad news. Minus 0.3. Um, yeah, I mean, providing they, yeah, you don't actually want to have zeros. Providing they're all positive, you're, you're in good shape. Um, wait, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, so this spreadsheet is on the web page. You can play it, play around with it um, more if you want to. Another thing that you can play around with is um, you can also just change these um, underlying models. So, I mean, if you, for example, suppose the bigram model had given a slightly higher probability um, to um, like coming after comes across. So suppose it was 0 0.02. Um, that that estimate is still less than the unigrams estimate. But nevertheless, if you run it to convergence, what's happening as it runs to convergence is the unigrams weight is converging to zero, and weight is just being split between the trigram and the bigram model. But it turns out that even though the unigram model assumes a, a, assigns a higher probability to like, and even though the word like appears in the held out corpus, that the optimization essentially finds it can just get a lot more value in terms of increasing likelihood by giving weight to the bigram model, because the bigram model gives much higher likelihood to as and much likely higher likelihood to R, so that data likelihood is actually maximized by giving um, just more, more and more weight to the bigram model despite the fact that the unigram model is more likely to generate one-fifth of the training data. Okay. So you guys can play with that. Um, 
Let me for just the last couple of minutes um, then say a moment about what comes after Model 1 and is then the heart of the, the rest of what you have to do for the assignment. So the first part of the assignment is um, implement that and get Model 1 to work. Um, and then the second part of the assignment is we go on to IBM Model 2. So there's this sequence of IBM models, the, the rest of which I will talk about next time. But the idea of these models is to make further refinements to the probability models that make them more complex, but also make them do a slightly better job at modeling how human languages work. So if you look at human languages um, as translations, commonly what you get is these alignment grids kind of look like this example I showed earlier. That there's various stuff going on reflecting the fact that different languages put words in different orders from each other. They don't all use the same word order. But generally it tends to be the case that you sort of get this sort of overall kind of, you know, goes along the diagonal. Um, and if you know something about languages, you might say, well, wait a minute, that's not true of some languages. There are some languages that kind of have very different word orders. In English, you get subject, verb, object. There are some languages that have completely opposite, have object, verb, subject. They should get completely the opposite word order. And that's a little bit true. I mean, it turns out, so for, you know, for language pairs with similar typology, something like French-English, you get a very strong diagonal effect like this. Whereas if you kind of think of languages which have very different word orders, the diagonal effect becomes um, less strong, it's true. But it normally is still there. And the reason it's still there is in written prose, or even when people are speaking, most sentences, except in, except in kindergarten as readers, most sentences aren't um, the boy sees the ball, the boy grabs the ball, right? They're not those SVO sentences. What you get is these long multi-clause sentences of um, while Jim was listening to the morning news, his wife called out it was time to make the coffee, and he went over and started the machine. And so that e even if each of those individual um, individual clauses sort of has its order flipped in a language with very different word order. Normally the translation will still have those three clauses in the same order, because that's basically just the iconic order in which events happen. And so you'll still get a kind of block diagonal structure. Yeah? So there is, I mean, there is a bit of bias, you're right, because clearly in some sense it's more mental effort for translators to reorganize the clauses than just to do them one at a time. Although, you know, translators really will do that if it's appropriate to do sometimes. But I agree that's a source of bias. But it's something more than that. There's also, I mean, this is the kind of thing people talk about in functional linguistics. There is just an iconic ordering of events. And although you don't have to present events to a reader in the order in which they happen, and sometimes people don't, and then you use things like um, before clauses where you kind of invert the order, that by and large, 90% of the time, people do present events in the iconic order, and that exists independent of it being a translation. At any rate, we're learning from translations. Okay, so what we want to do in model two is then to say, well, we somehow want to capture that translations normally l lie along the diagonal. Okay, that's all I have there. Um, and so in the programming assignment two, the general idea is when you're translating a word here, that it could be translated by any other word, but a word somewhere around here should be more likely, and a word somewhere up here should be less likely to be the translation of it. And so we'll put that into our models, which gives it a bias, to, a bias, not an absolute, to kind of learn roughly diagonal translations. And you'll see that that makes the MT system work a lot better. Okay, I'll stop for now.